So it is a it is a great uh, pleasure um, to uh, welcome uh, Georg Schett uh, to visit us um, uh, to kick off this meeting. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm so grateful uh, that Georg uh, traveled from Erlangen to uh, uh, see us, and he's on a time crunch, and uh, uh, he got here about 3.30 in the morning, uh, slept on the couch in the lobby for a while till somebody showed up to let him in a room, and he's leaving again today. So uh, he has made a great uh, 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 sacrifice to, to come to, to see us. Uh, by way of introduction, I could go on all morning about him. He is well known to everybody in this room um, for his uh, work in basic and clinical and translational uh, immunology. He has uh, made major contributions uh, across the board in uh, understanding uh, so many diseases and so many uh, areas of immunology. But what has caught uh, the world's attention in the past year is his work um, uh, and we're going to hear a, a bit more about this um, uh, in, in a few minutes, uh, about the uh, interprofessional and cross-disciplinary um, advances in science in oncology that um, have relevance uh, to uh, immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. And I think everyone knows what's coming here, and this is uh, uh, a, a first step in uh, taking uh, CAR T cells, which were approved in 2017 for certain lymphoreticular malignancies. Um, uh, and at that time, I don't think people were really thinking three dimensionally about how this could be applied to image. So, Georg, without taking any more of your time, uh, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your comments. Yeah, I can just give uh, back the thanks to Len. Uh, he's actually a very stimulating person. I know him since many years, and um, I think uh, what you have inherited is that you have a very uh, great idea to link actually science with clinics, and I think that's important for uh, the future medicine. We always have to have a little bit of heart of research and innovation as doctors, and the more they have it, I think the better we do in the future. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, I want to share with you uh, in the next 40 minutes uh, or 30 minutes um, the, uh, a, a project uh, which, which, which fascinated uh, me and uh, stimulated me really in, in, in thinking and rethinking disease and uh, uh, to give to provide something to a critically ill patient, uh, uh, which is probably important for the future. And I want to start with this lady here. Uh, uh, a typical feature of a lupus patient, a young lady affected by a life-threatening disease. And uh, she smiles, as you see, uh, because she was the first receiving CAR T cell therapy for a non-malignant disease, uh, in this case lupus. And uh, in the next uh, uh, minutes, I want to share a little bit of, with, you this, with, with you the story of her and, um, and uh, show you other patients and also uh, give you a little bit of background how we came to this uh, treatment. Now, I want to start with uh, this uh, uh, term coined by Paul Ehrlich, uh, the horror autotoxicus. So, Paul Ehrlich thought uh, the immune system or the body is um, actually quite good in um, differentiating self from danger or foreign from self, if you want so. And, and if this does not work, uh, the body would react against itself and would create a so-called horror autotoxicus um, and uh, he thought that's not possible, but everything is possible, obviously, in medicine, as you know. And uh, so we, we have sometimes the situation that uh, differentiation between self from non-self is not perfect, and you trigger autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease is a little fussy term. I always prefer it a little bit to link it to, um, uh, to, to autoantibody-driven disease, which is uh, uh, based on the fact that autoantibodies are... Uh, the key effector molecules for driving inflammation or some kind of tissue damage in the body. And this is summarized here in this review. Uh, basically, one of the central aspects is that uh, autoantibodies tend to form immune complex in the tissue and uh, lead uh, to complement activation and ADCC leading to uh, tissue damage and inflammation. But there are also, of course, other forms of um, 
autoantibodies uh, perturbing the homeostasis in the body, uh, activating antibodies against the TSH receptors in grave disease, antibodies uh, uh, inhibiting neurotransmission leading to myasthenia gravis, antibodies actually uh, which are directed against tight junction in the skin leading to a pemphigoid uh, and epidermal, uh, epidermolysis, and uh, activating antibodies against neutrophils, and you heard probably yesterday a lot in anchor associated vasculitis or against erythrocytes or some clotting factors perturbing actually uh, the blood system. Now, lupus uh, is a, a disease which is definitely a paradigm, uh, so to say, autoimmune disease as it's characterized by the deposition of immune complexes in various organs uh, uh, in the skin uh, leading to the butterfly rash and uh, dermatologists use skin biopsy to detect antibody deposition in uh, lupus lesion in the kidney, uh, which is the paradigm or the prime uh, inner organ involvement in lupus uh, associated with glomerulonephritis and also in other organs which are critical like in the heart, here an example for lippmann sachs endocarditis. Now lupus is quite interesting because it is an immune reaction against intranuclear antigens and they have to be released to get um, uh, seen by the immune system. So basically cell death is of utmost importance in lupus. And cell death can occur, of course, when you have a sunburn and your epithelial cells die or you have an infection and your neutrophils, uh, which are suicide commandos in the body, as you know, they basically lyse and perform netosis and expel uh, DNA and nuclear material into the uh, extracellular space. Now, this is finely regulated in the body, and you basically take up all this mess very fast, in a very fast way. But in lupus, you have a genetic background that all the, the garbage is not cleared rapidly. For instance, FC receptors is genetically linked to lupus, or other actually um, uh, um, phagocytotic receptors. So this uh, material lies around that is considered as a danger signal. It's free DNA, uh, it's uh, uh, DNA packed and decorated with nuclear proteins, and it's taken up by toll like receptors and leads to an activation of, for instance, cells like plasmocytendritic cells, leading to a robust interferon type 1 response. It's very similar to uh, a viral infection, which then leads to an activation of adaptive immune system, T cell, B cells, leading to the production of autoantibodies against these nuclear materials, their position in the tissue, and um, and inflammation. Now, as doctors, you <clears throat> tackle this disease or this process by, for instance, hydroxychloroquine, action of which is not fully clear, but it stabilizes also neutrophils and has, of course, also other effects. And this is basically considered as the aspirin of uh, SLE treatment. Um, then uh, uh, the new anifolumab and other type 1 um, interferon antibodies uh, tackling this uh, interferon type 1 response in lupus. Then the good old poisons um, uh, uh, like MMF and uh, cyclophosphamide, which are uh, um, um, uh, basically inhibiting massively the adaptive immune cells, T cells and B cells. But also at the center of the disease, antibodies uh, which in, uh, influence the B cell system like belimumab or rituximab, the key B cell depleting antibodies. Uh, so this is often not sufficient, and, and lupus patients often need um, quite substantial amount of glucocorticoids uh, to stay in remission. And that's a huge problem because these are usually young patients and uh, glucocorticoid use in the long run uh, has a, a, a substantial side effects. Uh, they are, have a, a per se higher cardiovascular risk lupus patients and glucocorticoids enhance that. And there are other uh, aspects like uh, bone disease uh, related to glucocorticoids. Now that, uh, that the B cells and the autoantibodies are a critical mechanism in lupus is, oh, is very nicely seen in this picture. It's a US study uh, um, of recruits and they basically uh, screened uh, um, recruits or later uh, patients who developed SLE uh, for their, their, their basically healthy sera they have stored. And what they saw is, uh, they also saw is that uh, bef long before, years before the first manifestation of lupus, so clinical manifestation, there is a maturation of the autoantibody response. So each line is basically one autoantibody entity, and you can easily see that they increase before the onset of disease, 
point one, and they also um, uh, increase in their in their in their numbers, which is also called epitope spreading. And uh, basically, when uh, when patients start with the clinical disease, they have a quite already a quite matured immune response, auto autoimmune response. So this is basically you can see the same, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis, in type one diabetes mellitus, or in or also in anca associated vasculitis. Now it has been extremely disappointing that rituximab in uh, in randomized controlled studies failed in lupus, and uh, this can have multiple reasons. But uh, you can see here. Uh, the data from this lunar study, and uh, there is the, uh, the lupus disease activity, placebo and rituximab are basically superimposable, and this is flare-free survival, and you can also see these curves are basically superimposable. So that was very strange that a disease which has a strong B-cell activation does not react to B-cell depletion. And as you know, with lupus studies, it's always difficult to say why there's a reason there. So always a strong placebo response is the selection of patient. Uh, but anyway, this was actually very counterintuitive. And I always say rituximab is probably the only drug in the world which is not approved for lupus uh, and has negative styles and still used for lupus, which is pretty uh, uh, awkward. Now, um, what is the reason for that? Um, and uh, and uh, post hoc analysis in these randomized controlled studies showed that, uh, uh, that patients having a complete deple uh, depletion of peripheral circulating B cells tend to respond better than uh, those with an incomplete uh, 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 depletion of B cells in the peripheral blood. So meaning that the, the death of B cell depletion is quite critical for the responsiveness to a B cell depleting antibody. And new, I think still unpublished data from obinotuzumab, which is also an anti-CD20 antibody with higher affinity, shows that actually response to uh, obinotuzumab, which works actually in lupus nephritis, is very much related to the death of B cell depletion. Now, um, that, um, that rituximab is actually very weak in depleting tissue B cells. I want to show you with three examples. Uh, the example number one is from transplant medicine. In this study, the transplant doctors treated the patient with rituximab before transplantation to avoid humoral transplant rejection. And when they did the transplant, they actually um, uh, um, took abdominal lymph nodes and checked them for CD19 positive B cells, namely in patients who have received rituximab. And you can see in the peripheral blood, the rituximab depleted the B cells, but in the lymph nodes, in the abdominal lymph nodes, you can see the gray bar. It's basically like the white bar that they were full of B cells, indicating that rituximab is very, has a lot of difficulties to, to deplete actually tissue B cells. There's also some data in lupus patients uh, when uh, physicians actually did biopsies of the tonsil and uh, after treatment uh, of lupus with rituximab, and they stained this tonsil specimen uh, for CD27 positive memory B cells. And they found actually, despite a quite good depletion in the peripheral blood, uh, the tonsils were full of memory B cells, and also germinal center B cells were still uh, on virtually unchanged in the tonsils. And the third example comes from rheumatoid arthritis. So after um, uh, um, uh, uh, treatment with rituximab, physician biopsies uh, biopsied the, the synovium of these patients. And in some patients, they could see good depletion of uh, B cells, but in many of the patients, they saw actually that there's still a substantial residual B cell number in the synovial membrane. So all these data suggest that while rituximab is a good depleter of peripheral B cells, because you have a lot of, of effector cells mediating ADCC in the blood, it's quite challenging to deplete actually the, the tissue B cells, where actually most of the action in an autoimmune disease goes on in the secondary lymphatic organs. So in um, March or in February 2021, uh, we had a young 20-year-old uh, female with lupus, and she had a kidney involvement, pleural involvement, she had endocarditis, arthritis, fatigue, and rash. And she cycled through a lot of therapies. So she started, uh, she had a disease duration of slightly more than two years, and she started through hydroxychloroquine, mycophenolate, tacrolimo, cyclophosphate, pelimumab, and rituximab, pretty much um, for a young girl, right? And uh, 
Um, and then despite all these um, uh, efforts, she still had a very active disease, which is illustrated by uh, continuously super high double strand DNA antibodies from 8,000 to 12,000 units with a cutoff of four, and the proteinuria continuously of four to six gram per day with a cut of 0.15 gram per day. So she definitely had uh, active disease. Now then we thought, can we offer her something? And then there was the idea should we use Taratumumab, which is a plasma cell, uh, CD38 uh, targeted plasma cell, anti-plasma cell antibody, or should we do a, a more courageous approach and, uh, uh, and expose her to uh, CAR T-cell therapy? And CAR T-cells, for those of you not being familiar with CAR T-cells, the CAR T-cell is, a, is an, usually an autologous cell. So you take the cell from your body, take the T-cells, and equip these cells with a CAR. And this is the CAR, as you see here. So the CAR consists of an extracellular uh, part and an intracellular part. The extracellular part is uh, important to recognize a so-called tumor-specific antigen. That doesn't need to be tumor-specific. It can be any antigen. And uh, CD19, which is specific on B cells, is a classical antigen used to kill malignant B cells. Uh, so that's actually uh, um, ascertained by a single-chain variable fragment of the immunoglobulin binding actually this antigen. And upon binding, uh, this this car is activated and the intracellular part actually mediates this activation <clears throat> as T cells always need two signals to get stimulated, two pushes. This intracellular part has a co-stimulatory domain which can be either CD28 or for 1BB and a CD3 setter domain which uh, mimics the T cell receptor signal. So when actually the antigen is bound, um, there is an activation of this T cell, this autologous T cell, and the T cell then kills the target cell by, for instance, secreting perforin or FAS. So it's in basically an antigen-dependent uh, killing of the cell. Now, um, what we did with this young lady is the following. Uh, so basically, we took, we made an apheresis and collected uh, the white blood cells. So in the white blood cells, we had about 50% of T cells. And then you basically enrich the T cells by negative selection. So you end up in about 95% T cells as a starting population. And this starting population is 100 million cells, as you see here, indicated by this small circle. And over uh, these 12 days, you basically expand these cells. They get at day one with a lentivirus, the CAR. So basically, uh, they are transfected by a lentiviral vector. And then they are expanded. And over these 12 days, they expand about 50 folds. And in this case, we had at the end 5.6 billion cells. And of these 5.6 billion cells, roughly one third are cars, as you see here. So not the uh, transduction efficacy is about one third of the cell. That's very similar in hemato-oncology. Uh, so from these um, uh, uh, 1.8 billion cells, we only took 50 million cells, so a very tiny amount. The rest you freeze, and these um, uh, 50 million cells are then infused unspectacular with a 10 minutes uh, infusion, short infusion into the patient. Uh, that's all. So um, what happened is that, um, and we were quite nervous on that. Why? Because first we were not sure whether we can get enough T cells from the apheresis, because usually lupus patients are lymphopenic and, get, and, uh, and receive, actually, my, she received mycophenolate, she received steroid, we had to taper them a little bit, and we were not sure if we can expand them well. The, third, the second point was we were not sure whether the, ex, the expansion of T cells from an autoimmune patient, also containing out, potentially autoimmune T cells, would create actually a massive reaction in the patient. So this all happened actually at the bone marrow transplant unit at the first, with the first patient uh, to, uh, to ensure maximal safety. So what has happened, they liked it. Uh, so you can see here that they, uh, they enjoyed it very much, these CAR T cells in the patient, because this is day three, day seven, day nine, and day 16. And you can easily see in this fax plot uh, indicating CD3 staining in the y-axis and the CD19 cars then in the x-axis, so these are cars, that they massively expanded from 0.3% being CAR T-cells of all T-cells after day nine, one-third of all 
T cells in the patient were actually CAR T cells. And then there was a rapid decrease of these CAR T cells after day 16, most likely because they are then moving into the tissue and do their job. So they did their job, and the job was to kill the B cells. And you can see here, November 2019 to March 2021, this was the rituximab effect. That was the second rituximab effect. And you can see here the B cells never went away, even increased then. And then with the CAR T cell infusion flatline uh, with the B cells for the first time in the, in the patient. And then uh, what you also see, and that was the, really the first surprising finding for us, that the, uh, the double-stranded DNA antibodies, you can see here 4,000 to 12,000, for the first time uh, dropped massively, and then actually zero converted between day 33 and 44. So um, the results in these patients were excellent. And um, I should say that uh, with the initiation of CAR, the patient stopped uh, everything. So basically, that was even before with the FRE, we, we, st we stopped uh, mycophenolate before the apheresis. We tapered the glucocorticoids to 10 milligram and then completely stopped the glucocorticoids. So the patient had no immunosuppressive drug treatment whatsoever, except this conditioning therapy, uh, which was done here with this um, uh, uh, blue line indicated, uh, it's between the blue line and the red line. And uh, you can see that after this CAR T cell therapy, for the first time, the C3 levels normalized. This is the normal uh, range here. And um, also the proteinuria uh, disappeared in this patient. So that was very stimulating. And, um, and we then thought this could be really a, an approach how we could treat autoimmune disease, at least refractory autoimmune disease in a different way. So we went then into other four patients. So this is patient one I showed you, and then there are, <clears throat> there are um, four more patients um, which are depicted here. And you can see here the, the situation at day one and the situation at day nine. And you can see very easily that there is a, in all of these patients, there is a massive expansion of CAR T cells. Uh, that's uh, very, this is very dynamic, and it always happens after day nine, you have the peak. The peak, it has different heights. You can see here, in this patient, you had 11% CAR T cells of all T cells. In this patient, you had even two thirds, almost two thirds of, CAR, um, uh, of T cells being CAR T cells. Um, and I should also say that the in vitro part, the expansion of T cells and the transfection efficacy was always extremely stable. And that was interesting because uh, the patient had received uh, uh, different pre-treatments before, uh, and they, they had a different stage of their disease. And despite all these uh, clinical differences, uh, the production of CAR T cells worked extremely well in all of these five patients. Now, clinically, uh, complement factor normalized in all the five proteinuria seized, as you see here, double-stranded DNA antibodies uh, uh, disappeared. And also what was very remarkable that, um, that the overall um, condition of the patient uh, and fatigue is one of the ways you, you can measure that you have with all the limitations, but still uh, uh, fatigue improved a lot. It doesn't completely went to zero, but it improved a lot. So we think that a lot of this fatigue in this young, young men and women um, are actually related to a massive immune stimulation and, uh, and inflammation in the body. So this is a busy slide, but I think it's an important piece, um, and it's not so difficult to understand. In the, in the upper row, you see autoantibodies, and it's always baseline and three months follow-up. And you can see this, this, uh, this dramatic decrease in double-stranded DNA antibodies, single-stranded DNA antibodies. These are antibodies against secondary necrotic cells, uh, um, which are basically a nucleosomal uh, antigenic component, and they also go down nucleosomes go down. And uh, what was also quite interesting that two patients had a clear SM Smith antigen response and they also went down, which was surprising to us because we thought it's extremely stable. And one patient had raw antibodies and uh, these antibodies stayed. Uh, so that was interesting. And it suggests that some of the antibodies may come actually not from the plasma blast and B cell compartment because CD90 is expressed on the plasma blast, but not on the plasma cells 
that in the that antibodies from the long-lived plasma cells they may actually not be touched by uh, by CD19 CAR T cells. So the question is, if you want to touch them, if you need to touch them, that's all unknown. But you could touch them theoretically by uh, having another antigen of CAR T cell, which is BCMA, uh, widely used for multiple myeloma treatment. What is, however, an advantage that you don't tackle the long-lived plasma cell compartment, obviously, is the fact that old vaccination responses like measles, rubella, mumps, varicella, zoster virus, and tetanus remained remarkably stable. Uh, so, again, indicating that you don't wipe out the immune memory completely, uh, and the long-lived plasma cell combined is probably not much touched by this, by this therapy. So, what happened with the CAR T cells? You can see here at the long-term follow-up, up to 400 days, and uh, uh, basically you can see the peak at day 9 in all the patients, and then after 30 days, they go down substantially, and then in the long run, you can still find a few percent of CAR T cells occasionally, but sometimes in most of the patients, actually, they, they disappear. You cannot detect them, at least with a FUX analysis in the peripheral blood anymore. So that means that the, these cells are either in the tissue or they actually died uh, in the patient. Now, uh, they obviously are dysfunctional, at least, because what happens after um, after between 50 and 150 days, on the average at 100 days after the CAR T cell infusion, and this is patient one, two, three, four, five, uh, the B cells came back. So this situation was quite, uh, the oncologist says, oh my God, the patient is dead, because for, for a lymphoma patient, uh, when, you, when you basically do CAR T cell therapy and the B cells come back, it means the lymphoma comes back, and the prognosis is then very grim in the patient. Uh, but we, we said, well, let's see. I mean, when the B cells come back, not automatically the disease must come back. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, for us, it was a little bit relieving because we felt it could happen that we lifelong actually uh, wipe out the B cells because the cars can stay for decades in the, in the body as uh, um, uh, the hematoncologist of Carl June in Philadelphia have shown. At the same time, when the B cells came back, actually the cars... Uh, uh, went down. You know, this is a logarithmic scale here. Um, and uh, then we started to analyze these B cells. And these B cells, uh, it's quite interesting that what you do is you reboot the B cell system into a so-called baby, I say baby B cell system, right? Uh, it's, uh, what you see is that uh, the, naive, the, the new B cells are naive B cells, and you lose the memory compartment, you lose this active memory B, activated memory B cells, and you lose the plasma blast. So basically, you reboot um, the B cell system uh, by actually a deep depletion of uh, the B cells by the CAR T cells. Obviously, also a deep depletion in the tissues because otherwise you wouldn't uh, see this dramatic change between the nave and the memory cell compartment. And in support of this, the B cell receptor sequencing, basically the heavy chain. Uh, showed that at baseline, you have a situation like we have. We have IgG, um, IgA, and a little bit of IgM. And uh, uh, you can see then what happens in this patient one, uh, it's only IgM and IgD. The same for patient two, three, and uh, five. Only the patient four had a pretty unchanged B cell receptor pattern. We, we don't know what this means at the moment. But basically what it shows that you... Uh, change basically uh, to a non-class rich B cell system after CAR T cell therapy. So basically, here you can see uh, what happens in the first 18 months, um, and uh, you can see here patient one with a follow-up of 18 months. At this time, uh, two uh, patient two with a shorter follow-up, three, four, five, and here the sleet eye uh, to to K score completely disappeared without relapse. Of a, of a lupus um, a, a despite no therapy. So these patients are all without therapy. And also the double strand DNA antibody didn't come back, which means that at least to, up to now, there is no maleducation of the B cell system happening because that could happen, of course, because you would think that you still have the genetic background in this patient and you have the um, theoretically the autoimmune T cells present. But at the moment, we don't see any recurrence of autoimmunity or of disease. So the patient uh, one is now uh, more than two years uh, in, uh, in remission. Uh, Doris remission, no sleet eye, no MC3, no proteinuria, no WCD, and no treatment. And you can see that this um, 
curve shows the B cells. So most of the time of the remission, the patient has actually a reconstituted B cell system and also responds to vaccinations, I should say, because that's also important. Now, what's the tolerability? Uh, the, the big concern of CAR T cell treatment, which happens quite frequently in cancer, is the cytokine release syndrome, which is called so-called hyperinflammatory syndrome. Um, this happened uh, at a very, very low level only. So you can see that here between day one and day three, this, uh, three of the five patients got fever uh, without any uh, hemodynamic consequences, but with a uh, short increase of the C-reactive protein level in the, in the context of this so-called CRS grade one, uh, which you usually treat with antiphlogistic therapy. Sometimes you have to use a single shot, for instance, of uh, an IL-6 receptor antibody uh, to, um, uh, to basically break that, uh, that fever. Um, the key lessons here are it's feasible. Uh, with respect to aphoresis expansion and reinfusion to perform CAR T-cell therapy in autoimmune disease, uh, it is, we see a rapid and sustained disappearance uh, of B-cells and the clearance of double-stranded DNA antibodies. Uh, lupus manifestations actually cease uh, despite the complete withdrawal of anti, uh, um, not anti rheumatic, uh, immune suppressive uh, therapy. And um, uh, the important thing that the, uh, we are pretty comfortable that the, the B cells recur um, and, uh, and uh, this, there's no association with disease, but which is probably related to the fact that the B cell system is reset in these patients. So now a few words in the last five minutes about um, uh, two more indications. And this is. Uh, the first patient with uh, uh, anti-synthetase syndrome uh, treated with CAR T cell. And uh, you can see here the CK level between 5,000 and 20,000. Rituximab actually worked initially, relapse then, fast relapse. Rituximab again, no, no response. IVIG and tacrolimus brought it down again to some extent, quite good extent, but not normalization. And then uh, recurrence of disease, rituximab didn't work at all and cyclophosphamid also didn't work. And here then the infusion of the CAR T cells and the, uh, basically over now almost 200 days, complete normalization of the CK level. Uh, you can see here that CAR T uh, um, dynamics are very similar to lupus with, uh, with, a, with a peak at day nine, which means that they engage uh, the, the B cells and then expand. And uh, um, in a plasia phase of about 100 days with uh, subsequent increase of the B cells. So when you look at this MRI, you can see very nicely the difference between baseline and three months. So this is, uh, these are the hamstrings. So you can see here in the uh, axial uh, uh, image, um, fasciitis and uh, myositis disappearing here. And also here in the hamstrings, a, a massive uh, inflammation of the, uh, of the muscles and the um, fasciae, and also in the vastus medialis here. Uh, with a resolution after three months. Also, the, um, uh, the uh, interstitial lung disease in uh, um, antisynthetase syndrome, and here the very severe form, uh, at least uh, functionally, ha has been uh, oxygen dependent. Uh, you can see here uh, massive uh, uh, um, inflammation of the basal areas and a partial res resolution, quite good resolution, probably with uh, some residual fibrosis. Uh, in the follow-up uh, uh, in the follow-up image. Now, uh, what is quite amazing that this patient was uh, pretty much bedridden. He was unable to walk more than 10 meters, and after three months and six months, he walked uh, more than five kilometers. And also, standard tests like the 30-second sit-to-stand test was possible in 30 seconds seven times before not possible. And uh, we don't do this with beer. We do this with water, uh, even in Bavaria. Uh, this is a glass bottle of 1.3 kilogram, and you can see that um, uh, that was mu much better. And we also recently treated uh, uh, a severe case of systemic sclerosis initially with uh, a CAR T cells. And here, uh, this is a lady, and she had uh, um, a um, uh, here this uh, increase of CAR T cells again, very similar dynamics uh, uh, of increase and also, again, reconstitution of B cells roughly between 50 and 100 days. Uh, and here you can see this uh, 
massive expansion of CAR T cells. And I should say, this was also surprising to us because you know, your gut feeling always says, mastoscleroderma is more a fibrotic disease, maybe not so many B cells. But uh, when you look at this massive expansion, you can see how many B cells are there. And, uh, and also patients receiving rituximab before, you would think they are depleted and lack the target. No, there is, there's, there's plenty of B cells there. Otherwise, there you wouldn't see this massive expansion of the cars. And um, what you see here is uh, a so-called FAP bed, which is FAP stands for fibroblast activated protein, uh, which is a fantastic technology to image actually the activation of the Mesenheimer cells, uh, which comes from tumor medicine, uh, uh, actually looking, imaging the tumor stroma in checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And you can see that you can use that also in non-malignant disease. And you can see this. Uh, uh, substantial involvement of uh, the heart with fibrosis, and uh, which basically shows my, not fibrosis as a scar, but actually mesenchymal activation, an active process, and also in the lungs. And after three months, uh, substantial clearance of these lesions uh, uh, in the patient. So what are the challenges and frontiers? And that's my second last slide. Uh, that's very early, you know, so we have to learn uh, uh, with this therapy. Uh, safety. Uh, cytokine release syndrome, we think that it's quite well handleable. It's much less frequent than, and severe than in oncology, simply by the reasons that the, the B cell burden in the patient is much lower than in malignant disease, and therefore you have less engagement of CAR, uh, of CAR T cells. Infection is always a critical point, right? You have a phase where you, uh, um, uh, at the beginning of one week, where all the leukocytes go down due to conditioning, uh, you could have an infection here. So it's always an issue where we have to, one has to monitor these patients carefully, that's clear. Um, but we are quite comfortable that since you don't uh, induce hypogamma globulinemia, that this is also not a, a, a substantial problem. And the long-term B cell depletion, yes, it can happen. We, we, and it will probably happen once, yeah? But uh, at the moment, it doesn't seem to be the regular uh, problem in these patients. Efficacy patient profile uh, is the question, you know, the question is, do you have patients who have actually autoantibody production mostly on plasma cells, right, and not on, on plasma blasts? We have to find this out. They would not respond to CD19 CAR T cell therapy. Um, then we wait for the relapse. I mean, we have not seen a relapse. We will see a relapse for sure. Nothing is 100% in medicine. But uh, the question is how long you are relapse-free. If you are relapse-free forever, super. If you are relapse-free for only in the median one year, we would think that is probably not a very good therapy. And uh, finally, the vector, the type of vector is still a matter of question. Uh, at the moment, all the data in the autoimmune diseases come from one vector, and we don't know how other vectors work. But I don't assume that they work essentially different. Now, procedure and costs are often, uh, of course, another point. Uh, I think one needs a center structure to, to do CAR T cells where rheumatologists, hematologists, oncologists work together. I think it's, a, it's a really a, a teamwork. It's not a thing that the, the onco can do alone or the rheuma can do alone. It's a very nice teamwork, and that's why it's linked to, I think, to larger medical units. Uh, conditioning treatment is still a question how much you need. You need Minimal, you know, I mean, the conditioning treatments compared to um, autologous stem cell transplantation is one tenth. And we, we went down with one patient to even half the conditioning, and the patient is still in complete remission. But that's a matter where I think people will work on in the future, and you can probably do less, but not nothing, because otherwise the CAR T cells not, do not survive. And then cost effectiveness, of course, is a question. Cost effectiveness will much, very much depend on the on the fact how long the patient is drug-free and disease-free. If the patient has, is five years drug and disease-free, this might be uh, uh, cost-effective uh, rather than continuous treatment, which is also not super cheap, especially when you think of the drug prices in the US. But that's obviously out of our hands. You know, We are not creating the costs. We're not a company. And that is uh, a question which will be has to be answered much later. Uh, so at the end, um, these are the five patients I introduced you. Um, this is the sixth patient, and uh, we made a CAR T cell day last year uh, in summer. We invited them to uh, talk about their disease and about the therapy. It's very touching for us um, uh, how these, pe uh, these, uh, these patients spoke about their change. And the meanwhile, we have eight lupus patients, three dermatomyositis patients, and three 
scleroderma patients successfully treated. So thank you for your attention. So a, a topic that has been broached at biologics um, uh, uh, a number of times um, over the years is the intersection of um, immunotherapy of cancer, uh, which we've had now for over a decade uh, in an escalating fashion in terms of uh, checkpoint inhibitors, but now immunotherapy of cancer is far beyond that. Um, with, uh, with a, 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 a horizon that is uh, hard to get your head around with so many clinical trials going on. And that intersection was immunotherapy of cancer and immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, that balance between um, inflammatory uh, components of the immune system and tolerogenic and regulatory components, which has been exploited to, um, you know, treat cancer, but has had a uh, 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 an adverse event profile that has been formidable, fascinating, um, and challenging to all of us uh, who have strong interests in this area of, of immune-related adverse uh, events. Um, Dr. Adam Moore is the Herbert Irving Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at Columbia. Um, he is a laboratory-based uh, 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 immune uh, uh, researcher who has done some really interesting work in this area. I tried to drag him to Cleveland for today, but uh, um, he's in the comfort of his office right now. And Adam, we thank you so much. And uh, I've asked him to just uh, uh, give us his perspective on this um, uh, burgeoning area of the pathogenesis of uh, IRAEs and the area that we're so interested on is trying to hone our therapy um, to treat them. So welcome. All right, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you good. All right, so thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, it's hard to convince people to leave New York, I guess. Um, so I'm going to talk, so, so it's going to be difficult to cover the topic in half an hour, but I decided to focus on two aspects of IRAE, immune-related hazards event, mainly about the pathogenesis, the mechanism, and uh, what should we expect in terms of biologic treatment. And since um, many of us are clinicians, I'll start actually with the case. So uh, this is actually a case from our clinic. We have uh, immune-related hazards event clinic here at Columbia. And um, this is a, a 56 years old woman uh, died of, with B cell lymphoma. Um, and at the same time, she had actually uh, six uh, months of thoracic back pain. Uh, for her lymphoma, she was treated with CHOP followed by rituximab. It didn't really work. And then she was switched to nivolumab, which is an PD1 antibody. Uh, her tumor progressed very well. The lymphoma actually disappeared. During this course of the treatment, she, was, she developed hypothyroidism that required replacement therapy. But more relevant to us, she also developed uh, something new, which is actually thoracic back pain. That went uh, very bad, it progressed very fast. And her um, oncologist started on steroid, as they always do. Uh, she responded very well. But obviously, after they taper it, the pain returned. And that's uh, the setting that she was referred to our claim. So the first thing that we did was actually uh, obtain MRI images of the back, and that's what we saw. Um, so uh, what we see on the left actually is bone marrow edema, uh, which uh, was actually quite significant. But more than that, on the right side, we can see actually that there is actually a, a para spinal mass um, that look actually inflamed. There's also a right side blue effusion. And um, we didn't know what it is. Uh, could it be the tumor, actually? So at that point, what we did actually, we obtained a biopsy of this uh, uh, mass, and uh, we were happy to discover that that actually was not a lymphoma, but yet it was full of immune cell, neutrophil, CD4, CD8 cell, chronic and acute inflammation. With um, the time setting and the association with uh, the uh, anti-PD-1 anti treatment she got, we decided that this is actually IRE uh, variant of uh, spondylitis and we gave her anti tnf agent. Uh, in this case, that was actually Umira. Uh, um, and within um, a few weeks, um, she did very well. Uh, her complaint disappeared. Uh, repeat imaging revealed that the mass completely melted. Um, and the lymphoma uh, still is not 
uh, here, and we're talking right now six, six months after the initiation of the treatment. So what can we learn from this case? Um, um, and, and I think the main message of this case is to show that this is something new. This is not typical seronegative arthritis. Uh, this is not one of the typical IRE arthritis. It's just something new. And this is what typical for, for this field. It's new disease, new mechanism, and new conditions. Um, the one concept that we need to understand before we go into the mechanism of IRE is the concept of immune tolerance, which is really the basic uh, uh, concept uh, that the uh, immune checkpoint are dealing with. Uh, there are three mechanisms of uh, uh, tolerance that I guess we, you guys all know about. Uh, the first one is central tolerance. Um, this is the idea of negative selection in the thymus, where uh, high affinity T cells need to be removed either by apoptosis or diversion into uh, Treg. Um, the cell with a lower affinity, actually a uh, naive cell, will uh, mature and release to the periphery as conventional effect of T cells. This is one mechanism. The second mechanism to avoid tolerance and vote immunity is mediated by multiple types of cell beyond just uh, thymus derived TREG. This could be the IL-10 uh, TREG1, TGF beta producing t 3 dendritic cell, or the most uh, or, or the more uh, known myeloid myel derived suppressor cell. However, this is still not enough, and we do need other mechanisms to avoid tolerance and to avoid vote immunity and to maintain tolerance. And one of them is mediated by receptors. We have a set of inhibitor and active receptor on T cell. Um, and um, uh, the final example of uh, tolerance is actually CD28, a cost multi receptor on T cell. And why this is related to tolerance? Because this is a mechanism to ensure that you need more than one signal to activate T cell. It's going to be harder to activate T cell, whether it's against self antigen or whether against infection, and that's actually limit the uh, immune response. The other mechanism, which is more related to our talk, is uh, TD1, program cell DET1, which is um, an inhibitor receptor expressed on T cell and supposed to turn off TCR signaling. Um, TD1 is a member of uh, multiple inhibitor receptors expressed on T cell. They usually express when the T cell is activated, usually in the context of the immune sinus, so that we can see here. TD1 is one of them, CTL4 is another one, and there are actually many, many other that for simplicity, I didn't include uh, on this slide. And with immune checkpoint inhibitor, we neutralize signaling of this receptor and enable the cell to be more activated. We can see it with anti-PD1 antibody or anti-PD2 PDL1, which is the ligand for PD1. We also can see the same thing with antibody to CTL4. And in our field as a rheumatologist, we uh, actually use a data set which does inhibit uh, CD4 signaling, but actually it's a, a block uh, CD18 and CD86, the ligand of CD4 on the antigen of a density cell, another way to manipulate the system. Um, and um, this uh, system of inhibitor checkpoint offers a lot of opportunity for treatment because we can either use agonist or antagonist to enhance or decrease uh, T cell activity. In the field of oncology, there are many, many. Uh, PD-1 antibody, what you can see on the left is those anti-PD-1 antibodies that actually uh, approved by the FDA. And there are many, many more in uh, advanced stages of development. Um, there are PD-1 antibody, there are pd one antibody, ctl 4 antibody, and earlier this year, anti-LAG-3, another inhibitor receptor, uh, neutralizing antibody were also approved. So there are many, many of them. Just to emphasize how the, uh, the, the extent End of the field, you can see on the right the number of the clinical trial with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. And in 2022, we're talking about 1,400 trials, which is a huge number, more than any other cancer intervention, more than cell therapy, more than uh, viruses, more than targeted therapy. It's still the leading uh, um, part, uh, aspect of, of uh, cancer immunology or cancer treatment. So these are huge numbers. Um, but again, PD1 is not the only one. Uh, there are other targets that you can see here on those uh, diagram that uh, can be targeted together with PD-1 or PDL one uh, TG-CD-47, CTL-4, of course, as well as CD-19 and others. Some of them are inhibitory, some of them are activating, but all of them actually are being, are, are being targeted with multiple biologics. So what are the numbers? Is it really good for cancer? So the answer is probably yes. 30% of the patient will uh, respond very well to the intervention. Of course, it depends on the type and the genetic of the tumor, 
Uh, but still the majority of them, around 60% of the cancer patient will not respond at all. Some of them will even develop a secondary resistant mechanism uh, that avoid, that prevent them to get uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. A another issue with this uh, uh, medication is the uh, concept of hyperprogressive disease. And this is uh, something that we still don't know how to explain, but 5% of the cancer patients that will receive checkpoint blockade, their cancer will progress really, really fast. And um, in two or three weeks after the initiation of the treatment, um, they might actually uh, die for, from progressive disease. Um, we don't know how to explain that, but it's a significant concern. And then more relevant to our talk is IRE, immune-related adverse event. And what are these? So these are actually a T-cell mediated condition. I mean, we target T-cell with anti-PD-1 actually. And what you can see in this organ is infiltration of T-cell. So it's a T-cell mediated disease. What you can see on the left is that every single organ can be actually involved. It could be from the skin to the heart, lung, joint, every single organ. And the unique thing about it is that all these organs are infiltrated with T-cell. Um, on the right side, we can see uh, actually a, um, a lung tissue that actually we stain in the lab, and uh, the T-cell are marked with yellow and orange. Orange is the tissue resident cell, the cell that's supposed to be in the lung to provide that uh, with immunity, and the uh, yellow cell are T-cell that actually migrated to the lung after the treatment of PD-1. Um, what are the numbers? I mean, how common it is? So in, in this table, I've summarized um, the type of the IRE, um, whether they associate more with anti-PD-1 and pd one antibody or ctl 4 or combination, and the timing to the symptoms. Um, so it's relatively common. Overall, I would argue that at least 50% of the patient will develop something Many of them will develop more than one adverse event. Um, some of them are um, mild, some of them are very severe. Many patients will have to stop uh, um, life-saving immunotherapy treatment just because of the severe side effect that sometimes we cannot treat well. Um, the main message of this uh, uh, table is to show not just to impress you with the number, but to show you that the number are different for PD-1 and CTLA-4. The number is different for the timing. Some of them are very acute. Some of them are very chronic. Uh, arthritis, for example, which is very relevant to us as rheumatologists, can happen even a year after um, PD-1 is initiated. So the time is different, association with drug is different, and the question whether it's tumor type related, it's still an open question. Um, arthritis and neuritis, and actually the endocrinopathy are different because they're usually what we call chronic. And chronic IRE are usually those type of IRE that will stay forever. Whether you treat a patient or not, they will stay. Um, so that's actually for, uh, suggests a couple of things. Some of them are bad, some of them are good. The bad thing about it is that, well, the patient will have inflammatory arthritis for life. This is not really good. The patient will have, uh, will lose his thyroid function or develop diabetes and that will stay forever. So this is actually a bad thing. And now we started to talk about the concept of uh, uh, secondary uh, enhanced atherosclerotic disease as we see with patients with active rheumatoid arthritis, should we worry about it? Because those patients actually, and that's the good thing, will not really die from the cancer. So in a sense, it's actually a good thing to have IRE. Uh, it's quite intuitive. You activate the immune system to fight the tumor. You activate the immune system also with other organs. So it's a good thing. And what you can see on the left is the difference in survival. It's a couple of Americans to show that patients with IRE actually survive more, which is a good thing. More than that, those with chronic IRE, or more specifically, patients with inflammatory arthritis, will stay with us forever, which in a sense, or in a cynical way, is actually a good thing to have. Um, and um, the more we wait and the more time we, we observe those patients, we start to see that there are more and more uh, chronic IRE uh, presentations. So what about the mechanism? That's the topic of um, uh, this, this talk. Um, and I tried to summarize it into five different um, explanations why we develop IRE. Um, and, and, and what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to show the uh, different uh, pathogenesis mechanism, the different processes, and show some data, some from our lab and from other lab to support um, uh, my claims about the mechanism. So the first and the most intuitive explanation is T-cell activation. And the idea here is that we all have cells that escape negative selection um, and they are kept latent, checked, with the fact that they express high 
PD-1 level. Uh, and that, that's something that we all do have. Once we treat them with anti PD-1 antibody, we release the cell, the clone proliferate, and they do go ahead and attack multiple organs. So this is this activation theory. Oh, um, it's not a theory actually, it's, it's a process. The other explanation is the cost reactivity. Um, so we develop immune response to cancer, and this is uh, uh, the uh, purple cell that you see on the left. Those cells will appropriately fight the cancer, sometimes eliminate the cancer completely, but they will spill over. They will migrate to the bloodstream and try to look for uh, epitope antigens that are similar between the tumor and the other organ, cause activity. And um, in that case, we develop more adverse event. And indeed, in case with pneumonitis, uh, with guess with lung cancer, we see more pneumonitis. In cases of melanoma, we see more skin IRE. So it does make sense. Um, a clinical observation to support uh, the T cell activation model is what happened when we treat patients with autoimmunity, existing autoimmunity with a checkpoint blockade. And the number here are quite uh, impressive, again, support the concept of T cell activation. For example, in case of PMR, polymyalgia aromatica, almost like 80% of the patient will flare once we treat them with PD-1. Rheumatoid arthritis, half of them will flare, and that's relatively fast during the course of the treatment. On the other hand, it's very uncommon with lupus, misconnected tissue, and some type of vasculitis. So, so again, supporting the observation, clinical observation to support the concept that we do activate T cell with uh, the PD-1 antibody. Uh, other mechanism. So uh, by standard inflammatory inflammation, meaning not really T cell specific, uh, we can definitely demonstrate that there are many T cell in uh, inflamed organ that uh, the TCR, T cell receptor, has nothing to do with uh, um, the, the presence in that organ. This is no specific T cell responses. We also have to remember a major role for B cell. Uh, in endocrinopathy, half, half of the patient, around 50%, will have antibody to the thyroid or pituitary or pancreas in case of diabetes. So there's no question that they do play a role. And also there's a major role for cytokine because we can actually see and measure high level of IL-6 and IL-17 in inflamed organ. Um, a very clean example to demonstrate um, um, the um, first model is the story with IRE myocarditis and autoreactive T cell. Uh, and the overall idea is that we do have anti uh, T cell to recognize uh, myosin, and these cells don't do much because they have the PD-1 and they kept check. Once of the patient with anti-PD-1, those T cells proliferate and then go ahead and attack the heart. In this nice paper that demonstrated here, and that's what you can see in the flow panel here, is that we all have um, cells that react with um, myosin. This was done with tetramer staining. And at baseline, before treatment, we're talking about 1% in the heart or in the lymph node or the spleen. But once we get with anti-PD-1, the number go to 15 and 6% of the cell. So uh, we definitely activate the cell, and those cells can be recovered from the inflamed heart tissue. Uh, this was also demonstrated in patient, and this is the work on the left that you can see here from Zhao and Wee. And they actually were able to isolate cytotoxic CD8 T cell from the heart of patients with IRE, I, um, IRE myocarditis. Uh, whether it's uh, what cell actually mediate that, so Jim Edison published a very nice paper where he used uh, one of the animal models for IRE myocarditis, PD1 deficient, CTLA4 upload deficient, and demonstrated those CD8 the, in the heart a, a media disease by adopted transfer experiment. Um, another um, paper to support the second model, the cost activity, is the story with Napsin A. So we start with clinical observation that, as I mentioned earlier, the patient with pneumonitis, and as you can see on the left, a uh, patient with lung cancer, non small cell lung cancer, have more pneumonitis than patients with melanoma. Uh, and again, patients with melanoma have uh, vitiligo, which patients with lung cancer don't have. And that led to the idea of cross-reactivity. So in a very elegant work, uh, FLAT actually uh, sequence tumor tissue as well as uh, lung tissue, um, some from the same patient, and look for shared um, mRNA and shared uh, antigen. And he found many, many things. One of them was um, uh, the protein uh, napsin. And this elegant work he was able to recover T cells that recognize with the same napsin from the tumor lesion, as well as uh, from the lung, suggesting that really cross-react. Uh, whether the origin of the cell in the lung are from the tumor or vice versa, 
that we don't really know, but the idea is that we have very specific set, the same clone of T cell in both organs. What about the role of cytokine? So um, in, in this work um, on the left, they um, basically did a serial biopsy from a patient with IRE colitis. And uh, in addition to the fact that they were able to find a very different cell environment and composition of immune cell, they were able also to show that there are a lot of IL-17 and IL-6 in the inflamed uh, colon. Now, um, IL-17 is a very interesting target, and um, animal models show that the actual neutralization of IL-17 in animal model of IRE can really actually prevent IRE colitis. What about IL-6? Well, initially, studies were very encouraging, right? Because as you can see here, this is um, a, a syngenetic tumor model in mice. Mice were treated with anti in CTLA-4 and, and did the tumor pro, that's the purple line. However, we neutralize anti-IL-6, IL-6 with anti-IL-6, then um, the tumor was much smaller and the mice didn't develop IRE, suggesting that neutralization of IL-6 might be a good way to treat those patients. Other model of um, IRE neuritis, in this case, uh, EAE model, encephalitis, showed the same result. However, and that's actually the main problem here, a recent paper from uh, Bass and Topelli showed that with patient, that's not the case. So this is true maybe for the animal, for the mice, but for patient, it's a very different story. Uh, because um, in a very interesting pa paper with uh, 100, that was published actually a month ago, where they look at 146 patients, they show very clearly that anti-IL-6, including also anti-TNF, indeed it prevented IRE, but led to significantly increased tumor size. Our data shown here in the middle can demonstrate that actually in, in other neural model of IRE, this isn't the case. Administration of anti-IL-6 and anti-TNF can lead to faster tumor growth. And this is a major problem because that's what we do in the clinic. Um, what about IRE arthritis? So again, this is a different disease, right? It's nothing that, uh, as the case uh, in the initial presentation uh, I described, this is a different disease. This is not what we're used to. For example, they can present in picture which look like rheumatoid arthritis. However, they don't have a, a rheumatoid tractor and CCP. Very different disease. Seronegative, and again, the case uh, show you that this is actually not typical spondy-like cases. I mean, the location and the timing is not typical for spondylar arthropathy, but here they do have HLA, the typical for uh, spondylar arthropathy, including B27. Polymyalgia rheumatica, classic symptoms, however, they don't have CRP, they don't have s surgery, and they require more than 20 milligrams of prednisone. So again, different disease. In addition to that, we have actually a, a pattern which is called activated OA, what we used to call inflammatory OA, but in this case, we see those cases in very young patient that doesn't have history of OA, no risk factor for OA, to get immune checkpoint and develop single joint OA at the age of 30. Uh, so, so different presentation, and if it's different presentation, the idea is that it's made it by different cell. So what we did in order to understand what are the cells that made it IRE, we, we collected, um, we performed single cell RNA study from patients with different type of IRE. From in this study, uh, the data shown here is patient with arthritis, pneumonitis, and thyroiditis. And with single cell RNA uh, study, we can actually uh, get high resolution of the really subtype of T-cell. Not just whether it's CD4 or CD8, but what type of CD8, what type of CD4, what did they do, what gene they have, and what's the functional status. And what you can see here from um, uh, this uh, and it's plot in the center is that patients with arthritis have a subset of cell, uh, which is um, a CD4, T helper, CX, CX, CR3 positive, delta 3 positive, that actually um, much higher than patients that don't develop arthritis, and other IRE patients don't have. Complement to that, patients with thyroiditis, which is the, the blue line, have a different type of cell in the peripheral blood before they develop arthritis. And uh, the Disney plot here at the bottom shows that with uh, also as proof for other subsets of, of T cell, it doesn't look the same, suggesting different cell may a different IRE. This was all done pre-treatment. What about post-treatment? So uh, we did actually, we collected the blood from um, another group of patients that develop IRE arthritis. And in this case, we see that the CD8 pattern uh, whether we look for in the peripheral blood for naive T cell, naive, uh, central memory, effect on memory terma, is very, very different. Suggesting T cell do mediate that, and it's different for every organ. And um, 
maybe uh, looking for this cell can actually help us to diagnose or even use as a biomarker to diagnose IRA arthritis, mainly to the fact that they're very, very different than what we're used to seeing in the clinic. Um, what about the case of pneumonitis? So uh, this is a, a, a CT scan of some of our patients. And the one thing if you know about IRA pneumonitis is the multiple type uh, to make it more complicated. Uh, uh, the first type is chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis that has different uh, uh, patterns and, and images and on images. And the other one is more classical organism pneumonitis. And that's what you see at the bottom. So two types of IRA pneumonitis. And, and the more interesting thing, if, if we collect blood from this patient and do RNA-seq, they have different T cell signature, which are very unique. So most of the patients with uh, CHP will have uh, this type of helper cell in the peripheral blood compared to patients with organism pneumonia that will have different type of actually CD8 cell. So different cell, different IV. Um, so what these cells are doing, right? Because I just told you that they have different cells, but the most important thing about T cell is what the T cell receptor can see, what can it do? And in this case, we collect the blood from multiple patients and um, before and after antibody treatment and sequence the T cell receptor itself. Uh, what you can see on the left is that, and just focus uh, on the blue versus the red. Um, the blue is actually the number of the cells that are cloned, meaning the T cell that have more than one T cell that have the same uh, CDR3 sequence. So these are cells that are activated. When you read patient with anti-PD1, and this is the red, all the group, even patients that don't develop IRE, this cell expand. So PD1 activate T cell, whether it develops symptoms or not, it's going to be a different signature. So it activates all the T cells, whether it's pathogenic or not. Um, but the one thing that we see, if we actually look at the content of this T cell, what we can actually see, for, we, see we can see two things. First, in, um, in IRE arthritis, there are more expanded clone compared to other type of IRE or even patient at beta. Every circuit that you see here is a T cell. And um, the size of the circle is how many copies of the same TCR we have. So IRA is more significant than the other. And the interesting thing here is that most of those expanded clone, and you can see actually the real CDR sequences are coming from one cluster, which is CD, uh, cluster 16, which is CD8 effector TBEX21 positive, suggesting that if you really want to treat IRA, maybe this is also for uh, our target cell. Um, if ev evidence for the non-specific event. So if everything is PD1 mediated, one would expect that the cell in the inflamed organ will be coated with anti PD1 antibody. So this is a slide that we made uh, at the, you know, for, from different IRE organs, liver, lung, pancreas, and colon. And we stand for CD4, CD8. And as you can see, there are many CD4, CD8, as expected. There are other cells that are not showing you here. But where are the cells that actually were targeted by the anti PD1? anti pd one is given to patients every three weeks, and it can be detected in the blood weeks after the administration. So we actually did a staining to look at the FC of the PD-1 that we gave the patient. And what you can see here, many of the CD4 and CD8 cell in the liver, they're not called to the anti pd one antibody. So with anti pd one antibody, maybe we're targeting other cell, and this cell that we see here are actually just by standard, it just came there by chance, Maybe they don't really see the right uh, epitope as we expected. So non-specific T cell activation pattern can be demonstrated in tissue. For example, if you look at the pancreas, there's nothing there. There's not any clue about anti-PD-1 antibody in the case of the pancreas. So again, multiple mechanisms. Um, what about therapies? And this will be the last uh, couple of slides. So what do we do right now? How do we treat those patients? So um, the first line, as we all do, is steroid. Well, steroid do work well. Um, they actually definitely uh, treat IRE very well. Patient will, uh, you know, care. I mean, once we take her, probably it will come back again. But it's work well. We cannot use it for endocrinopathy because it doesn't help. But for most IRE, it's working well. What's the most problem? What's the problem with that? It can lead to higher tumor growth rate. Uh, there's a good data about breast cancer patient that steroid in those which is higher than 20 milligram can lead to enhanced uh, metastasis rate. So we have to try to avoid steroid as much as we can um, for IRE patient. What about the other type of um, drug that we use? How can we repurpose current drug to treat IRE? What about anti-TNF? Well, we know that we cannot treat hepatitis, but definitely work for colitis. 
data about tumor genesis, tumor, uh, genesis of, of anti-TNF is very different than what we're used to. Usually we believe that anti-TNF are relatively safe to treat wound arthritis patient, and the number of cases of tumor are not huge, maybe for basal cell, but in case of established tumor, it's not really clear. So anti-TNF probably don't lead to more tumor in our you know, autoimmune patient, but if you already have the tumor, it's not really clear if it will accelerate it or not. So no clear data. Um, a bad set, for example, um, might work well for myocarditis, rituximab, well, for very selected. So in most cases, it doesn't really work. It worked for uh, Bullos rash, um, Guillain Barre like symptom, but for most IRD, it doesn't really work. These are the ongoing clinical trial, and the one that I highlighted actually is a clinical trial that we do have at Columbia where we treat IRD patients with Tuximab or anti IL 6. Um, IL 6, does it work well? Yes, it's worked relatively well, but again, more survival. Tumor will grow faster, patient will die faster. So, not really a good thing what we're doing with IL 6 and maybe TNF. So, what can we do? What we can do to make drugs better. Um, and, and this is actually some, just a slide that can summarize the entire talk, right? So, so this is what we need to do. What I showed so far is that different IRE, different cell, different uh, cytokine, everything is really different. So the main issue is how can we use those differences in order to design a treatment that will be specific to the inflamed organ and not to the tumor? Because at the end of the day, we don't want to interfere with the protective inflammatory responding to tumor. And I think we can do it by three ways. The first way, uh, which I divided into tissue restriction and specificity. Can we make drug, in this case, anti pd one antibody, that will be specific to tumor microenvironment? And the answer is probably yes, and we are doing that, actually, in the uh, preclinical uh, uh, development of, of those approaches. So can we make a pH-dependent anti pd one antibody because the pH in the tumor is lower than in the joint? So the answer is yes, and uh, time will tell if it's a good approach or not. Another nice approach to restrict the intervention to uh, the site of the tumor is to use by specific antibody, where one arm of the antibody can block PD-1 or CTRA-4, and the other arm of the antibody will be specific to tumor antigen. That will direct the antibody to the tumor microenvironment, spare the other organ, and it might or might not work. Intratumoral injection is still always a good option, and uh, it might work as well. Um, and also we have to remember the story about in the inhibition of integrin that might be useful to treat IRE, not really to prevent it, due to the fact that you can limit the uh, homing to um, inflamed organ and not to the tumor. What about cell type? And that's a probably yes, we can make drugs that will target one cell and not the other, cells that are unique to the tumor microenvironment, the tumor trying to respond and not to um, uh, the inflamed organ. We have paper and data showing that a, a high dose IL-2 can spare the effect on T-ray. Uh, we have data showing that GMCSF with anti-CTLA4 anti antibody can actually limit IRE and enhance the anti-tumor uh, inflammatory response. And, and as well as uh, approaches to target different uh, helper C, uh, TH17, whether it's CD4, TH17, the classic one, or CD8 that express IL-17. Uh, so this is also good approaches. And finally, about uh, pathway specificity. So can we target specific subset based on different signaling pathway that you need to affect or, or tear it? Uh, and the answer is yes. So one uh, example of this approach is PA3K. So PA3K is a kinase expressing multiple types of T cell, but there are different isoforms in different subsets of T cell. For example, the PA3K in CD4 T cell is different than CD8. The one in effect cell is different than TREG. And if that's the case, uh, can we use small molecules to inhibit some of the isoform to inhibit, for example, only effect of cell and not T-ray, maintain tolerance, and yet uh, um, don't really interfere with that tumor response? And the answer is probably yes, and there are many ongoing trials at the preclinical stage, at least, to show that this is a good approach. And um, I, I, I'll stop here, um, and um, I just want to thank um, some members of my lab that study IRE, and these are the members that are um, highlighted in red. Uh, we have many collaborators in Colombia and outside Colombia for the study. Uh, we're using many core and we have several uh, funding sources. And uh, I would like to thank you at that point.